Yes. So um, I'm really happy to see everybody here tonight. And my idea for this program was that it would focus on images of the sky that are taken with astronomical instruments, whether those be um, cameras on small telescopes or uh, the radio telescopes or James Webb or Hubble. And um, so my plan is, if I can find my little mouse here, my plan is that in each of these meetings, I will pick out some astronomical objects um, that's, that are centered on a particular theme that we'll talk about. And we'll discuss the appearance of the objects and what their shape, color, structures tell us about them, and a little bit about what, what they are, how they came about, what their evolutionary history is, and why they're important in an astronomical context. I also thought that since we're meeting about once a month, I would try and start out with a little bit of news of what's happening in the sky now. Um, and other than today, I really don't have a plan for what topics I'll be discussing in the future. So I'm willing to hear people's suggestions for topics. And <clears throat> you should feel free to ask questions. Um, they're free if I can answer them. Uh, if I can answer them, I'll let, uh, I'll try to answer them if not uh, when they're asked, but at some other time. But remember that I don't know everything in, uh, uh, about the universe for sure, but nobody else does either. So um, we're, we just do what we can here. So let's start out with astronomical highlights this month. It turns out this is a very interesting time, as somebody already mentioned. The moon is full tonight at 10.34 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And so uh, it should be very bright tonight. Um, the full moon in September is often called the harvest moon. And you'll hear people talk about uh, the spring moon, the flower moon, the wolf moon. Those, those names um, go back to different people throwing up different ideas, but we can understand that in around September, that's when harvesting happens. So maybe it makes sense that this is called the harvest moon. Another thing that's interesting about the moon tonight is that it's what is called a super moon, as opposed to a micro moon, as you can see in this little diagram. The moon's orbit around the earth is elliptical. So sometimes the moon is closer to the earth than at other times. Now this diagram is grossly exaggerates the degree of ellipticity or elongation of the orbit. But anyway, um, the moon this month happens to be occurring when the full moon, when the moon is closer than average to the earth. And so that's what's called a super moon. It appears bigger in the sky and it also appears brighter than an average full moon. And in this diagram, the, this photo down here, which actually uses um, images taken with astronomical telescope, you can see that it really is bigger than in the sky. Um, at perigee, perigee, peri meaning near, g being the Earth, at perigee, then at apogee when we get the micro moon. Martha, can I ask, why is it elliptical and not circular? Because it turns out from uh, our, the way mechanics works um, in physics that it's easier for a, a body, two bodies like a planet and, and a moon to be in an elliptical orbit than a circular one. If it's in a circular orbit, it can it can be more likely to get kicked out of its orbit. Um, and so all of the planets have elliptical orbits in their orbit around the sun. And that's very interesting um, because uh, it means that they travel faster sometimes than at other times. And it's because of that ellipticity that Kepler figured out that Copernicus wasn't quite right. It happens because remember, in the solar system, there aren't just two bodies. 
there are lots of different bodies and they have a tendency to pull in one direction or another out of that circular orbit. But if they get in the right elliptical orbit, they can last in that orbit for a longer period of time. Okay, the other thing that's happening tonight, which doesn't happen all the time, is that the moon um, is going to travel partly through the Earth's shadow so that we have a lunar eclipse. Now, we, we last year we had last spring, we had the um, total solar eclipse. A lunar eclipse is when the moon moves through the Earth's shadow. A solar eclipse is when the Earth moves through the moon's shadow. And we don't get lunar eclipses or solar eclipses every month. We have full moons and new moons every month. Because, but we don't get eclipses all the time because the plane of the orbit of the Earth around the sun is tilted with respect to the plane of the moon's orbit around the Earth. And so most of the time at full moon, the earth is above or below, the, the moon is above or below the earth's shadow. So here we have an example where we do not have an eclipse. Um, it's It has to be at full moon, and here we have the earth's shadow, but the moon is below the earth's shadow as viewed from the sun. Here we would have the case of a total lunar eclipse if they were lined up in the same plane. But tonight, the moon is just barely going through the Earth's shadow. Only 3.5% of the illuminated face of the moon will be blocked by the shadow. And so you could go out and look at it, but it would be really hard to notice the difference unless you could take a photograph and look at two photographs. So that's how that's why I'm not that excited about a partial lunar eclipse. They're really hard to tell that it's happening. Okay, another thing that's happening this month is there's what we call the equinox. And the equinox this year is occurring on Sunday, September 22nd at 8:44 a.m. And the equinox marks the date on which the sun's path crosses this, what we call the celestial equator, which is an extension of the Earth's equator out to very large distances. And of course, it marks the beginning of fall, the one that occurs in September. There's another equinox which occurs in March, which is called the spring or vernal equinox. Um, and in the summertime or after the, the uh, autumnal equinox, the sun is above the celestial equator in the sky and the, it takes the length of the day is much longer and the sun is more directly overhead. In the winter time, the sun's path across the sky is below the celestial equator and the length of the day is smaller and the sun's light is, it, the sun is less overhead. And so the term equinox comes from equal night, equinox meaning a night from the Latin. Um, and it turns out that everywhere on earth, the length of the daylight hours is 12 hours on the equinox. And we know that in the summertime, the length of the day gets longer and it's different at different latitudes on the earth. In the wintertime, the, in the Northern hemisphere, the length of the day gets shorter and shorter and shorter as we go to December. And that varies depending upon your location and latitude on the earth. But on the equinox, everywhere on earth, the length of the daylight hours is 12 hours. And this has to do with the fact that the earth is tilted on its axis. And so that means that the sun's path changes in the sky from summer to winter. So that also takes place. The bad news is that, you know, the beginning of fall means that winter's on its way. But six months from now, um, winter will be over. Okay, so those are two things. The other thing I just thought I'd mention is 
what you can see if you look at, up in the sky at night. Mercury is barely visible in the glare of the sun. You really have to know how to look, where to look, because it's so close to the sun. Venus is very low towards the west after sunset. Um, Jupiter rises in the east around midnight, and Mars rises also in the east in the same direction, but about an hour after Jupiter. So if you're up in the early morning, Jupiter and Mars are both above the horizon. Saturn is vi visible in the southeastern sky in the early evening, and it's overhead throughout the night. So if you look up, you can look for some bright objects. And maybe if you start, if it's clear, you can familiarize yourself with some of these objects. And we'll watch how they change their position over the coming months. Okay. So what are we going to talk about tonight? <clears throat> well, I thought, you know, it's the solstice. And the solstice is important because uh, it has to do with our length of the day and night and also with how much, uh, how direct the sun rays are falling on us, keeping us warm. And of course, we're headed towards winter. So I thought maybe we should talk a little bit about the sun, the sun in the sky. So here's just a nice picture of the sun in the sky. We know there are clouds, and this is this obviously is a typical picture of Ithaca. Um, the clouds are there, but the sun is also there. But we can also take a look at some other pictures, of course, professionally taken images of the sun. And we should remember that the sun emits its light because in the center of the sun, hydrogen is being thermonuclear fused into helium in the core of the sun. And the core of the sun has a temperature of about 15 million degrees. The sun doesn't have a solid surface like the Earth or the moon, but it does have what we would call weather. And that's really what I want to talk about today because there are two interesting things or aspects of this. Um, solar weather is what we might call activity on the sun. And currently, we're in a phase of high activity, and that activity is responsible for the aurora borealis, which was brought up earlier, which we never get to see here in Ithaca, because whenever there is an event that produces the aurora borealis that we might see, it's cloudy. But let we can hope that we might get to see it in the coming months, and so I thought we'd talk about that. Um, these two images, the one on the left shows you a full uh, image of the entire sun. And you can see that when you look at the sun with a professional um, instrument, the sun has structures on it. It is not a solid surface. The fundamental difference that um, you see in the colors, the color difference, what that tells you is that the surface of the sun is not at a constant temperature. And in fact, there are regions on the sun, in this case, these whiter regions are hotter than, say, these darker regions. And this is the image on the right is a, a close up of viewing the edge or the limb of the sun where you can see that sometimes there are breakouts or eruptions or storms on the surface of the sun where material from inside of the sun gets ejected upward and then falls back down on the sun. And so we're gonna talk about those events. So the topic for tonight is the sun, spots on the sun, and how activity on the sun can lead to the aurora borealis. And the fact that if you look at lots of images of the aurora borealis or in different locations, you can end up seeing these very different colors. What does that tell us? That actually tells us where in the Earth's atmosphere the particles which are coming out of eruptions on the sun are entering into the Earth's magnetic field structure. Okay, so here's just a close-up. Here we see some of these, what are called prominences or flares. And here is what we 
call a sunspot group. And again, what you're seeing that's different here is that this region, which appears very dark, is probably a few hundred degrees cooler than the region out here. And here in, in this limb, you're seeing material that's being ejected. And when you look at that more uh, looking down on top of it, not when it's on the limb, but when you're looking down on top of it, you see that it looks white. That's because that material is hotter than the surrounding material. So you have to keep in mind that darkness doesn't mean that there's nothing there. It means that the the material, the gas is cooler and brightness, whiteness in this image means the material is hotter. So it's temperature differences. So a little bit about our sun. Um, it's a hundred times bigger than the earth and it's a thousand times more massive than Jupiter and 300,000 times more massive than the earth. So it's really a very different beast than our planet. And we don't see into the center of it because basically it's so dense underneath that surf, the, what looks like the surface, which we call the photosphere, the region we see. So photo, the re spherical region we see. Um, but, but by studying the surface, we can actually infer what's going on underneath. And again, these regions are hotter and these regions are cooler. But the average temperature of the sun is about 6,000 degrees at the photosphere, the surface we see. On the other hand, I can make a cartoon diagram of what the sun looks like. So here's a cartoon diagram. The pink shows you the photosphere. And the photosphere is the surface that we see. And it's the region where um, the photons that are in there, the, the particles of light, they actually escape and reach us. Any photons, particles of light inside the sun never get to us because they run into something else. We also know that at eclipse time, and I'm sure you've all seen pictures of the eclipse, um, there's also this very diffuse, huge outer envelope which we call the corona, which is not normally visible. It's extremely hot, but it's very, very, very low density. And we only see it when we can block out the rest of the sun, like during a total solar eclipse. We also think that the sun has different layers. As you go from the outer part of the sun down towards the center, the density gets higher and higher and higher. So the density at the center of the sun is 160 times the density of lead, but it's not solid. It's made of nuclei. And um, as you go down, the temperature goes up and up. The density goes up and up. And in about the inner quarter of the sun, the temperature is about 15 million degrees. And that's where the thermonuclear burning takes place. And... We understand that it takes place in a uh, very controlled, stable way. The sun configures itself so that it can go through that thermonuclear burning for billions of years, because if it were configured in some other different way, it would either blow up or collapse. So the fact that the sun exists and looks relatively stable from the outside means that we actually can figure out what the interior of the sun looks like, even though we can't see inside. Okay, but what we're actually interested in talking about is what we call activity on the sun. And one evidence of activity on the sun is what, what we referred to as sunspots. Here's a little diagram that shows you, remember the sun is much bigger than the earth. So this shows you that some sunspots and uh, on the same scale as the size of the Earth. So these spots can be really big. Um, they're essentially cooler areas than the surroundings by up to um, even as much as 1,500 degrees. They last 
hours to months. And one of the interesting things is that they de can demonstrate, as they did to Galileo in the 1600s, that the sun is rotating. Um, so here's a little animation that shows that over time, the sunspot group moves. And in fact, the sun is rotating, but the sun is also rotating in a different way. It's not a solid body. So in fact, the sun rotates faster at the equator than it does at higher or lower latitudes. It's really not at all like the Earth where everything rotates at the same speed so that we go around once every 24 hours. The length of the, the solar rotation at the equator is 25.8 days, but at higher latitudes, it's longer. So again, other evidence that the sun is not as simple as the Earth, for example. Okay, another interesting thing, which is really the, one of the important subjects for us, is that over time, the number of sunspots that we can see on the surface of the sun varies. And it varies periodically with a period of about 11 years. And so this uh, diagram on the right just shows you all of these what we call sunspot cycles. Now, some of them are very well documented and other ones are less well documented because they go back before records were well kept. But you can see that within an 11-year period, the number of sunspots visible on the surface of the sun reaches a maximum and then declines to a minimum and then rises back up. And here on the left is two images taken in an earlier sunspot cycle. This is an image of the sun in July 2000, which was close to solar maximum. Um, and uh, here's one taken in March 2009. And so we are currently in sun, sunspot cycle number 25 since 1755 when scientists started recording the number of sunspots. And what's interesting, and a reason that I thought I'd bring this up now, is that the current sunspot cycle is predicted to peak next summer. And But what's interesting, so this shows the number of sunspots that have been observed since 2012. And the last cycle peaked at about 2014. And it was a lower than average number of sunspots. And this gray area and the red line is what was, has been predicted by scientists based on the last few cycles. But in fact, we've already seen more sunspots than we might have predicted, which is interesting. Um, uh, and you can follow this link and go and you'll, they, will, they keep this updated all the time. I just checked this um, a couple of days ago. Another interesting fact that doesn't show up in the number of sunspots but sunspots actually um, behave like magnets and they have poles. And it turns out that if we look at the magnetic field lines, so they behave, they have a North Pole and a South Pole like a regular magnet, um, you can, we can, we are able to measure the magnetic field and sunspots typically come in pairs and one of the pairs will show on the surface of the sun the south pole and the other one in the pair will be the north pole but those will be different on the sun from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere typically for example in the northern hemisphere of the sun the south pole would be the one in the direction of rotation and the north pole would be the trailing one but in the southern hemisphere of the sun, those would be opposite. The north pole would be the one that was leading and the south pole would be the one that was trailing. And this whole alignment of the poles on opposite sides of the solar equator reverses every 11 years. 
So the magnetic cycle of the sun is two solar sunspot number cycles or 22 years. That doesn't affect the activity in terms of the number of sunspots, but it's another very curious thing that uh, we have to try and understand why does the sun's magnetic field reverse itself in this period of 11 years. The earth has a magnetic field which reverses itself but on periods that are much, 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 much longer. So I just mentioned that because it's a very curious effect. And of course, it has to do with the interaction of the magnetic field with the temperature variations and the activity and the energy generation going on in the sun, because the sun is a much more complicated object. A star is a much more complicated object than the rocky Earth. Another, uh, uh, Nina has a question. I just had a question on the previous slide. Is the picture B, is that a, 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 a diagram or, or is that a... a That's, magnetic? That, is, that is an actual image, okay? okay. Of two, this is, this essentially is the cartoon picture. This is the real picture. And we are able to, mag, to measure the magnetic field and the direction of the magnetic field from the South Pole to the North Pole or reverse. And we see that that's different on both sides of the equator of the sun. And we think we understand this. And the reason is that the sun is this giant glowing body of gas and it has activity going on, different temperatures, different densities, and you get these eruptions from one side of the sunspot maybe to the other, to the sunspot pair. Um, and that's telling us about what's happening on the inside of the sun. So again, we can't see the inside, but by studying all these effects, we can learn about what's what must be happening on the inside of the sun if we understand physics. Uh, also, Robin has, Robin has a question. I do. Um, okay, I never took physics. So uh, if the hydrogen is, um, if this is fusion, that's go I'm, I'm curious about what is sustaining this activity in the sun that keeps it going. <laughs> I know. I wanna... So, so obviously, we're going to have to talk about more about uh, stars another time, um, and. Uh, let, let's let me look, let's look at it this way. All right, we we know the sun has been burning relatively steadily in the sky for four and a half billion years. We you know we can look at fossil records and we can figure out what the temperature of the Earth was. And yes, we've had um, warm times and cooler times, but overall it hasn't changed that much. So we have to make a model for the interior of the sun that allows it to last for a long time. What we understand is if you have a body, a, a, bo a giant cloud of gas of the mass of the sun, it can configure itself so that it looks like my earlier cartoon picture. It's going to look like this. If it doesn't look like this, it doesn't burn for a really long period of time. The, the, it has to be burning in a sustained, stable fashion, and it does that because if it burns too much, then it expands. And when you expand a gas, it cools down. And then the burning goes down because it's gotten cooler. If the burning goes down, then it collapses. When you collapse a gas, it heats up. So if it collapses and heats up, then it starts burning again more. So it's this regulation. It's gravity fighting a uh, uh, gravity controlling the burning rate in the center of the sun. And if it were di different, the sun wouldn't be able to burn for a long period of time. But we'll talk more about that at another class. Uh, Hank, did you have a question? Yes, Martha, thank you. Are there instruments here on earth that are permanently observing the sun? Yes, there are. There's there's something um, called the GONG, the Global Oscillation Network Group. 
and there are um, large optical telescopes which are designed to constantly observe the sun. There are also spacecraft which constantly observe the sun to try to learn about this activity. Um, and I'll come back and mention about some of this in a, another couple of minutes. We Because uh, when we get the aurora borealis, that is occurring because there's solar activity that's directed towards us. And uh, we want to know about that because it can interfere with um, communications, telecommunications. Okay, another, another interesting little fact is that um, there have been questions raised, as discussed in this book that I reference here, uh, that the activity of the sun could actually impact in a small way, the climate on Earth. And the main evidence for that is this shows the sunspot number as a function of time over 400 years. And you note that between about 1650 and 1715, there seemed to be an abnormally low number of sunspots. Now, what you also realize is that before about 1755, when scientists started tracking the number of sunspots, the, the records for the number of sunspots isn't so great. But it does appear from the records that are available that during this period, which we refer to as the Little Ice Age, where the winters were abnormally cold in Europe, um, that coincides with what was noticed uh, by an, a scientist named Maunder that there were a minimum number of sunspots. So it's possible that um, sunspots and solar activity can moderate um, or, or uh, interfere with the solar radiation enough to affect climate on Earth. Um, but you see that since then, there have been more active cycles and less active cycles, but nothing like this one. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the bottom line, the, the punchline from all of this is that we have to think of the sun as a dynamic object. There are flares which release energy or, or and light from the surface of the sun. There are prominences, so so you just get a release of a lot of light and energy. We get these prominences, which are the eruption of hot plasma off the surface, and the material will rise up and then it will fall back down. And they can form on the time scales of a day and then last for weeks to months. Um, and sometimes in these prominences, material from the sun gets accelerated in the explosive event that kicks the material up. It, get, it can be accelerated so much that it actually leaves the sun and can travel out away from the sun and not fall back in. Sometimes we get what are called uh, coronal mass ejections, those are the most massive, most energetic eruptions where we get the expulsion of a huge amount of plasma from the surface and the corona of the sun. So here is a, an image taken with um, a, a spacecraft of large expulsions of material coming off they're called coronal mass ejections. Um, there is hot gas, high energy particles, and light streaming out. And we see them in this image because they're moving out not towards us. We see them going out on different sides from the sun. Most of them are not directed at the Earth, but sometimes they are. <clears throat> so remember also that the earth has a magnetic field which uh, like a magnet has poles and the magnetos magnetosphere in the region around the earth is dominated by the magnetic field 
when we have these coronal mass ejections and solar flares, they come out from the surface of the sun. And if their particles come into the magnetic shield of the Earth, the may our magnetosphere has a tendency to push the particles away from us, which is good. We don't really want to get all these particles hitting us, but sometimes they can come in along the magnetic poles, oops, come down the magnetic poles, and when they enter into the Earth's atmosphere, that's when we get the aurora borealis. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this, but I'll just point out, this is the region of the Earth's magnetic axis. And there will be a little region at the North Pole and another region near the South Pole, which we call the auroral ovals. And that's where the particles come down the magnetic poles and don't get kicked off uh, away from us. So, <coughs> oh, sorry about that. We end up with the aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere, or the aurora australis in the southern hemisphere. And this is the glow that's produced when electrons from the sun flow down the magnetic field lines. And the different colors arise because they're associated with different atomic species in the Earth's atmosphere, which have a tendency to occur at different heights in the atmosphere, um, at 100 kilometers up or 200 kilometers up. And so what happens is, for example, oxygen atoms will have a tendency to glow red when they're hit by electrons. And um, nitrogen atoms have a tendency to release blue color. Um, and if you have some oxygen, if, if you have an electron released from the nitrogen that then hits oxygen, you get green. And if you have the iron, um, the nitrogen, and you have also some oxygen in a, in, in a, a different configuration, you can end up with pink or blue, or whatever. So essentially, it's the electrons are in the upper atmosphere. They come in along the magnetic field lines. They bounce into the, the oxygen or the nitrogen at different colors, at different levels, and that will produce the, the many different colors that you get. So as I said, this occurs um, in, in general, most of the particles that are emitted in the activity from the sun don't reach us because our magnetic magnetosphere um, pushes them off in different directions. But along the, uh, the ovals of the northern and southern hemisphere, you can end up with uh, getting the particles to excite the high oxygen and nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere um, where we get the auroral ovals. They're mostly visible at uh, at northern latitudes and also at certain latitudes according to the uh, alignment of the Earth's magnetic pole with the Earth's rotational poles because those two are not the same. You get the, we end up with what we might think of a, a, an aurora borealis is a geomagnetic storm. They're very dynamic because these these prominences and coronal mass ejections take place over short periods of time. So the aurora can come and go. It can move north, um, north or south. Uh, and that produces the dynamic effect that we call the aurora borealis. Of course, the other thing that you need to have in order to see the aurora borealis is the sky has to be clear. And that is our problem in Ithaca. <laughs> But uh, here's an interesting, um, there's an interesting website that I found, which actually predicts the Aurora Borealis for any particular day. This one is for um, a couple of days ago. And you can see in the, in, on this particular day, the, there was a probability of seeing an Aurora was r still pretty small in uh, Canada, 
and also in uh, off Antarctica. What we might do over the next months is keep our eye out for if there's a if one of these telescopes that we were talking about that that Hank asked about, if one of these telescopes sees a coronal mass ejection that is coming towards the Earth, that's how scientists can predict whether or not there will be an interesting aurora to, that is worth seeing. We also need to know that because the interactions can cause problems with telecommunications. Hmm. So here's our um, the solar cycle 25 prediction for the number of sunspots. And you can see Here's the average prediction from before. Here's what we're actually seeing. This is the day sort of variation of um, over shorter periods of time. And we're reaching the where it what we're seeing is that the number of sunspots we're seeing now is higher than is predicted, and it should peak somewhere in 2025. So I would say there's a good chance that there will be some more activity on the sun in the next year. Um, I don't know if it's good or bad that there will be a coronal mass ejection coming in our direction, uh, but it might offer the opportunity for us to see an aurora here in Ithaca. Okay, so my summary is that Ma well, Martha, I'm so, ma I'm sorry. Yeah. What time, what time of day or uh, what time of night is the time to do it? I've seen varying. Um, well, that 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 actually depends on um, this issue of where the coronal mass ejection, when it actually takes place, and where it's coming in relative to this to our position here on the Earth. Um, it could be in the evening. It could be in the morning. Mm. But it's going to be at night. Yeah. Because otherwise you can't see it here. Remember, it might be visible in another part of the Earth. It might be visible in Sweden because it's dark in Sweden and not here. Yeah. Um, but I think we have the chance over the next year to see some more of these events. Um, and, and as I said, the energy generation in the sun is almost constant. This is what you call weather, solar weather. But what's interesting about it, I think, is that it does have this periodic cycle of being at high activity or low activity. And right now, we're in a period of high activity. Um, and we know a lot about the sun, but there are, of course, a lot of other things that we don't can't answer. And uh, so predicting solar weather isn't all that different from predicting weather um, here on the Earth. You know, we can make some predictions about we're going to have a warm winter or a cold winter, and we're going to have La Nina or El Nino and what that's going to mean. But, but beyond that, we can't be too much more specific. So that's what I wanted to talk about for tonight. And so I'll take questions, but we also have three more dates that I've planned for the rest of this year. Um, and if people have suggestions for what they'd like to talk about, I take suggestions. Martha? Yeah, how tell us. How, how was the, during that period before they started actually counting the sunspots, but the, the theoretical was time before it where everything was red and kind of dotted how did they see the sunspots what were they using well in fact you can you can see sunspots with the naked eye if you're you of course you shouldn't look at the sun but you can you can see you can see sunspots i mean galileo you know figured out how you you can project the image of the sun through a pinhole in a piece of cardboard in a pinhole, and you could project the image of the sun. Um, and they did have evidence of the number of sunspots from before that, um, because Galileo started observing sunspots in the 1600s. So you you it, people weren't as uh, 
good at keeping records. But it, I guess it's also curious that that Maunder minimum occurred right when astronomers were starting to have the capability to observe sunspots. And, it, you know, there's a, a little cosmic conspiracy or coincidence. Um, Robin? Um, when you talk about stars, I wonder if we could talk, figure out, I mean, do stars all react to each other? Do they have gravitational uh, influences on each other? And is it chance that there's this ginormous star that's influencing the sun that we can't, you know what I mean? That there's something... Yeah, yeah, no, the people, people have raised questions about whether there's another, the dark, the death star, the dark star. Um, okay, so, so sometime we'll talk about what stars can do to each other. Um, yes, the good news is that space is actually pretty empty. And stars don't come close together. If stars come close together, bad things can happen. And we can talk about that. The good news is that uh, if 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 things are 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 calm and stable, then they're not interacting gravitationally. If they do, if another if a big star were to come by the the sun and interact with it, we would know about it. Um, so we've got Hank and Capex. Okay, Martha, I, how did the early astronomers look at the sun? Did they have filters that they used? Weren't I, there? I, I presume that Galileo, you know, took a quick peek at the sun. It was probably not good for his eyes. <laughs> but how, how did he even see something like a sunspot? Uh, if you take a quick look at, so for example, another thing, if if anybody still has eclipse glasses, and there is a report of a, a bright, uh, a very prominent sunspot group on the sun, if you go out and you put on your eclipse glasses, you can see it. Sunspots are that prominent that you can see them. <laughs> Back in Galileo's time, were there materials of that type that would have allowed him to do that? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and uh, that that's an interesting idea. What people also learned pretty quickly, um, and in fact, they used this as the way to observe the sun, if you if you put a hole in the roof of a building, which has been done, for example, in the cathedral in Bologna, Italy, there's a hole in the ceiling. And the sun, when it passes over that hole, it projects an image of the sun on the floor. No, next to it, there you and, go. And so I, I suspect that uh, th that was done in the 1700s. But I suspect that early astronomers who were, or early uh, scientists who were playing around with optics, they learned about things like this, these effects of having um, a pinhole and allowing light to pass through it, which causes the projection of an image of the source of light. Thank you. Is that Marty or Marsha? It's Marty. Question. Is, this, is it possible to discuss at one of the meetings the Big Bang Theory? Sure. Good. I would appreciate that. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you uh, what, what we know, what we don't know. And also, what we can't know, in the sense that our model actually tells us that there are some things we can't, some questions we can't answer. But yeah, that, that I 
I, I could pull that one off. I'll have to fake it a little bit, but maybe you won't know what I'm faking. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Nina? Or yeah. David? So, um, so people started to observe sunspots sometime in the 1600s. Or yeah. Were there theories prior to that that led them to look for sunspots so they knew what they were seeing? Or was no, this, I, I mean, it went it, the other way? It's the sunspots that got Galileo into big trouble because the the Catholic Church's view was that the earth was geocentric, uh, the universe was geocentric, and that the heavenly bodies were perfect. Hmm. And sunspots implied that the sun was imperfect. And that was one of the things that got him in big trouble. So but no, they... they they didn't under they didn't understand um what the what the sun what was causing the sun to shine um you know uh they even the ancient the greeks understood that the sun was different from the moon i mean one of the one of the i i talked about this in a lecture once upon a time but none of you remember that and i i barely do myself um the one of the Cosmic coincidences is the fact that the angular size of the sun in the sky is the same as the angular size of the moon in the sky. And that is a cosmic coincidence that is very unusual. Why are the sun and the moon, which are at very different distances, and they're very different in terms of their structure and composition and temperature and density and everything else, why, do they, why are they the same size in the sky? And that was very confusing, but the, in, 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 in the ancient Greeks figured out that the moon was smaller than the sun and that the sun was bigger than the earth and that the sun was much further away. Um, so they already realized that there was something different about those two. Anyway, they, they, how they how, uh, how Galileo made his first observations and how the the first thing that he realized when he looked with a telescope he didn't invent the telescope but he was the first one who really looked at the sky and noted things first thing he noticed was wherever he looked he saw more and more interesting objects more and more stars so. The bottom line being, we don't know everything. The universe is a wonderful, weird, exciting place. Um, but the sunspots were one of the things that got him in trouble. My and it is, and, and it's interesting that that was in the period of the Maunder Minimum, and it wasn't until after 1715 that the number of sunspots, the, the cyclic pattern really appeared. I'm not unmuted now. Oh, oh yeah, Betsy? Martha, I can't find my my hand raised thing. Um, so there must be historical records uh, prior to people observing the sun that might reveal other mini ice ages. Has anyone tried to um, look back at that um, and well, try to figure out distances between sunspots? I, I don't think there are any good records of sunspots earlier than that. Earlier, right, but, but I mean, could, could you tell? But, but people, were... people, people study things like tree rings. Yeah, or climate. You know, if, yeah. If they, they look at records. they they look at historical records, but this is the only the Maunder minimum is really the only case that I know of, where where that's that's as far back as we can go, where we have reasonably accurate measurements of the number of sunspots. But could you assume that if there were historical records of famine and cold, well, we uh, know by yeah. five hundred years prior that that it was the sunspots that did it. But you just it, you, we don't we do know that there are other ice ages. Yeah, but this is I think the Maunder Minimum is the only one where you can link the two together. Okay, having her knee replaced at the end of October. So the... anyway. Okay, well, I've kept you for an hour, and uh, I will will do something else in another month. 
Um, and uh, whether I'm brave enough to do the Big Bang next month, we'll see, but maybe. Um, but, you know, the idea of this is that I'll do what I did tonight. And I, if other people have other ideas, I'm happy to hear about them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Martha. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep, keep an eye on the skies. Go look at the full moon tonight. Will do. Thank you. Martha, could you stay on for one extra minute? I have a question to ask you. Uh, sure. and not about astronomy. <laughs> sure. Um, so we had a program committee.